Welcome everyone to today's devotion. We are in John chapter 11, and this is the uh, second uh, sort of proto-climax. Remember, my argument has been that there are basically three climaxes um, of John's gospel. So that is that all the themes of John um, you know, the, is basically in three parts. So uh, chapters 1 to 6, right, they find their culmination in 6. And then you get a redevelopment of some new ideas starting in chapter 7, which are introduced but really developed starting in chapter 7. They find their fulfillment in chapter 11. And then, of course, the entire book finds its climax in the resurrection of Jesus. But if we were to start in chapter 12 and go all the way to the end, we, we, we get this final uh, climax. And so here we are in John 11 with the second of these three climaxes, and it is, of course, the raising of uh, Lazarus. Now, remember, if you've been with us, um, uh, really, in any of the chapter, we've looked at four th major themes. There's other themes we've highlighted. Uh, Jesus as Logos, Jesus as Light, Life, and Lamb. Throughout the book, these themes keep coming up. Sometimes they're subtle, uh, but sometimes they're, they're made very explicit. And so it is very clear here in uh, chapter 11 that the main theme is that Jesus as life is Logos, or as Logos is life, right? That, that, that's, we want you to see that. Um, but even through that, we see the other themes as well. So the setting is, is laid out in the opening verse. Now, a certain man was ill. Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. It's an interesting statement because that story is not given until chapter 12. Um, and I don't think it's foreshadowing. I, I think John's readers um, already know uh, the story. Uh, that now, if you read the Synoptic Gospels, the identity of the woman isn't given. John identifies her for us. Um, so I think just more evidence of that. Regardless, verse 4, uh, Jesus says, This illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Here again is why these themes, Logos, Life, Light, Lamb, are so important to reading John. Because without those themes, Jesus is a false prophet. He says here, Lazarus ain't going to die. Don't worry about it. But Lazarus does die. But notice what Jesus says. He says, um, this illness does not lead to death, period. Rather, it, his illness, is for the glory of God. So, so right at the beginning, um, we are to be shocked when we discover that Lazarus is dead. Right? In fact, Jesus will, will in the next passage, make it very clear. Um, uh, it's in um, verse 14. Lazarus has died. It's very clear. Uh, that that Lazarus dies, and we should be shocked by that because of this predicament of Jesus. But either Jesus is a false prophet, which John isn't presenting him as that, nor is Jesus that, or that we are to see something else going on here. Lazarus will not die in the theological sense. So when Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead, that is a picture of what Christ offers the sinner who believe in him. This illness of sin will not end in death, period. Well, it goes on um, that Jesus stays two days longer, so he purposely delays so that Lazarus can die uh, physically. Verse 9, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. Now notice, it, you, 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 when you walk outside at, at nighttime, you don't radiate light from you to see your steps, right? Uh, so, so Jesus isn't just talking about the physical. There's, there's a spiritual theological interpretation here. He says that, look, if you have the light of Christ in you, you, those, though in a dark world, will not stumble. And guess where Jesus is going? To raise a man in darkness who is dead. Blind, deaf, all that. So all those other themes are culminating in this. What Jesus did for the blind man in chapter 9, he's going to do something even more radical with Lazarus in, in chapter 11. Um, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to wake him. Notice how easy it is for John to mix these themes. That Lazarus is in darkness because he's dead, and what he needs is the light of the world, life, to be given to him. 
Uh, so uh, we skip down to verse 17. Uh, Jesus came and found that Lazarus had been dead, had already been in the tomb for four days. Now that detail is important. Uh, two things worth highlighting. One is the emphasis on Lazarus being dead at least for four days. Um, it was common belief to those who believed in the spirit. The Sadducees did not. So this was a debate among the Jews at, at, at this time. But for the, like the Pharisees and others of their ilk, uh, it was believed that the spirit of a person would hover around the body for four days. This is sort of how they, they explained uh, people who appeared to be dead but, but came back. Uh, we would use more medical terms today. But what they did was they, they said that uh, it was uh, the spirit hovers around the body for, for four days. And so uh, after four days, the spirit leaves. Okay? So Jesus waits until there is no natural explanation for the resurrection of Lazarus. Now, again, pause there. Um, just because this culture accepted miracles, and Christianity accepts miracles, does not mean people were um, easily led astray to believe everything was a miracle. Look, the whole point of the four-day thing is, is because they believe dead people don't come back to life. The whole reason in chapter 9, the emphasis is on over and over again, the man was born blind and there's no other explanation why he can see is because it is a genuine miracle outside of natural law uh, and uh, of physics, right? So, so just because we think that because we've invented light bulbs, somehow we're superior is... is is, is ridiculous. Uh, but he's been in the tomb for four days, but also notice the detail that he's in a tomb. Now, tombs are dark. They're completely dark. You're, you're, you're shot off from light. So what Jesus does then, as the story unfolds, is the light of the world shows up to give life. And that's exactly what he told the disciples. Look, when the light of the world comes, those who are in darkness will see because the light of the world will be in them. That's what Jesus comes, comes to do. So verse 21, Martha says, Lord, if you had been there, uh, been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give it, will give it to you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha says, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. We, we should re recall this, this common theme we see throughout that where people confuse the spiritual with the physical you must be born again right well how can i be born again i can't go back to my mother's womb or uh if you drink the water i give you you'll never thirst again sir give me this water so i don't have to come back to this well this is a common theme um and it's it's sort of a, a fun little a back and forth in the narrative here it's the opposite um is that martha confuses the physical with the spiritual so when Jesus says he will rise again, she rightly believes in the resurrection, that we will be raised bodily from the dead. But Jesus says, no, in this instance, I'm not talking about just spiritual resurrection, but physical resurrection. He is going to come back bodily. Now, this is important for Christian theology because we believe not in a spiritual resurrection. Rather, we believe in a bodily resurrection. This is why the body matters. God made us not spirit trapped in a body. God made us both body and spirit. So what, 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 how we treat our bodies really, really does, does matter. And the Bible's consistent with this worldview. I don't want to chase that, chase that rabbit. So verse 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. So this is the center of this entire passage. This is the thesis. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. And so when you believe in the life, though you may die, yet you will live. Well, this has been developed for the entire book, hasn't it? When Jesus continued to talk about eternal life. So John 3, 16, God so loved the world. He gave his only son. Whoever believes in him uh, will not perish, but have eternal life. Notice here, Lazarus has perished, but he is given life. Though he die, yet shall they live. This is the center, really, of, of uh, the first 11 chapter, at least from chapter 7 to, to 11. We, we see that verse is it. Everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Notice, you, though you may die, you live, but you won't die. Right? Th this is where Lewis is right. He says that once you die to Christ, um, you, you'll, you'll never die again. And you've heard me say in our study of John that eternal life does not begin when we pass away. It begins when we believe in Jesus Christ and him crucified. 
Thus, the foreshadowing of heaven should be should be present realities for us. Joy and peace and love, contentment, all of that should be present realities in us now for those who are in Christ. That though we die, we shall live, but we will never die because we, we believe. And then verse 27, she said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. Now, Jesus then is taken to the tomb. Uh, I don't want to spend uh, forever on this. Verse 35, Jesus wept. Uh, the shortest verse in the Bible, we all know that. I'm not interested in exploring the why and the how, all that sort of stuff. Just Jesus weeps, and so the Jews respond by saying, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying? And that question, which is meant for criticism, we'll see another example of this. What is meant for criticism is a demonstration of who Jesus is. He who opens the eyes of the blind can heal the sick. That light of the world can also raise the dead. So he's not just the light of the world. He's life. And if you believe in him, not only will you see, but you will live. Why? Because he's Logos. Isn't that fantastic? The way, the way John, John is an excellent writer, very simple, uh, particularly in his Greek. But just a, a, a child can wade into the waters, yet an elephant could drown in, in, in its pond. Uh, go down to uh, verse 43. When he said these things, right, he's crying out to God. He cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen stri strips, and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. Notice that the, the tomb has to be removed, thus letting light in. Uh, and when Jesus speaks, um, the light of the world comes, grants life. He comes out. He comes out um, wrapped in the cloth, uh, um, which, which he would have been given a traditional Jewish burial. So he would have been wrapped. Um, and Jesus then orders for him to be set free. So notice that life means redemption. Life means liberty. Right? When we believe, we are truly free, which was a theme, I believe, is a chapter 8. Uh, when Jesus, who is being rejected, and we're going to see this theme come up, um, through that rejection, Jesus says, You are of your father the devil, who is a liar and a murderer from the beginning. Um, those who sin are slaves to sin, but I've come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. Well, this is now demonstrated in the raising of Lazarus. Those who are given life and light from the Logos and Lamb are then set free. Unbind him and let him go. Well, where the story goes from here is, is a strange turn. What we, what we want as modern readers is we want to have a conversation with Lazarus. We want to know, what did you see, right? And we write a book. I'll buy it, right? Be New York Times bestseller. It's not where the text goes. Because remember, if, if, if we do have these three climaxes, the theme of chapter 7 to 11 has been rejection. Right, so, so remember, at the end of chapter 6, everyone leaves Jesus except the disciples. In chapter 7 and 8 and 9, they're all wanting to stone Jesus. And so in chapter 10, Jesus is saying, look, my sheep know my voice. The others are wolves or the hirelings or they're trying to jump the wall. That's the good shepherd. I keep them away. So it's all about rejection. And that's where the, this story goes. So chapter, verse 45, many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, believed in him. That's the point. He is the life. But some of them went to the Pharisees to tell them what Jesus had done. Notice, even amid what is the last major sign before the resurrection, which demonstrates to everybody who he is, there are those who still reject. They still reject Jesus. So the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, What are we to do? For this man performs many signs. That's John's word. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and, and our nation. So from John's perspective, there is a political reason why uh, Jesus must be gotten rid of. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people not that the whole nation should perish. Now, if you are uh, someone who knows your Bible, knows your theology, immediately you think, it's ironic, isn't it? One person should die for the people? That sounds like the story of the cross. That sounds like a sound theology of the atonement. And it is. 
Because John tells us, verse 51, he did not say this of his own accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation. And not for the nation only, but also to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. Remember chapter 10. I have sheep who are not of this fold. So from that day on, they made plans to put him to death. That's interesting, isn't it? What we have in this chapter are two deaths. G, uh, Lazarus, though dead, is raised. Jesus, though living, will die. But what's interesting is the why of the two. Lazarus is allowed to die so that Jesus may, in grace, raise him again, picturing those who believe in Jesus will be given life. Jesus dies so that we, like Lazarus, may live. If you still don't believe me, which is made explicitly clear in John's interpretation of Caiaphas' statement, go down to verse 55 and notice the Passover of the Jews was at hand. There it is again. There it is again. So not only is Jesus' life in light um, as a result of him being Logos, he gives light to the blind uh, or as, uh, and, and he gives life to the dead. It's Logos language, but notice at the root of it is laid out here in the comment made by Caiaphas, let him die so that the people may live. But right here we see Passover is coming, and guess who tomorrow morning we'll see is about to enter Jerusalem? The Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, so that in his death we might live if we believe. It's fantastic, isn't it? Hope to see you guys here tomorrow.